It really boils down to this, that all life is interrelated. We are all caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny and whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. We are made to live together because of the interrelated structure of reality. Hi, I'm Dale Latour, and this is Eco Ecclesia, the church in a climate crisis. My plans for Eco Ecclesia are to develop and expand an ongoing collection of segments that explore various eco theological topics. This is for the purpose of envisioning how the church must be reshaping itself to be a force for creation care in the years ahead, as this planet faces unprecedented ecological dangers that will make life increasingly difficult for all of us. The church cannot remain silent on this, and there's literally no time to waste, scarcely any time to take to explain why. But we have to anyway, in order to do all we can to bring more of the church into this awareness of the predicament in which we find ourselves. Something I've been watching over the past year and a half is how the church bodies are addressing this crisis through their denominational structures. The best indicator we have from each of them is through their websites, their public face, which by far is the most accessible source for finding information on a denominational body. Websites show us, or should show us, what a denomination thinks of itself, about its mission, and how it lives that mission. And I have to say, judging from what the websites are communicating, a sense of urgency about the climate crisis is not there. Home pages are most completely lacking in not only a sense of urgency, but in even any mention whatsoever of the crisis. It's business as usual, just as it was decades before we knew, before we knew better. This is something the churches are going to have to think about. It's going to become increasingly apparent that this is a matter where the health of billions is at stake, and therefore a matter of utmost theological impact. The impacts upon human life make this the most profound danger ever faced by inhabitants of this world. How can the church not react in crisis mode over this? But the denominations, as big and present as they are, are just the umbrellas over the churches. It's still vital for our overall health and readiness that they be diligent in communicating the crisis and providing resources to help its churches communicate and minister in the days ahead. But the local churches have their leaders and laity too, and in an internet age, also have the means to educate and unpack a theology we need for our time, which is an unprecedented time. So there's the matter of the mission that the churches must undertake. The segments that I intend to develop for Eco Ecclesia webcast will address the theology and practices that we will need to undertake to become a church responsive to this crisis, and therefore relevant and faithful. As unattentive as the denominations as a whole have been to the crisis, and also far too many of their churches, our churches, there is life out there in the trenches. We have to look to these to see the story in action. And it is these stories which I intend to tell most often for they will become the most prevalent segments for our eco-theological journey. Today we have Tyler Sitt, pastor of New City Church in Minneapolis. I found out about Tyler and New City Church through a headline that grabbed my attention in the New York Times. Young Methodists plant churches with environmental gospel. So I read the article and I immediately contacted Tyler to have a chat with him. So, Tyler, what is your journey that has formed you into someone who gets called to this type of ministry? Um, I'm a Minnesota native, and there were two stories uh, throughout my childhood that kind of uh, shaped me up to be an environmental justice advocate and, a, and also a Christian minister. Um, the first one is I had this really deep and intense connection to nature. Um, I was in Boy Scouts, I was in Cub Scouts, and so <laughs> we would go out camping, and I hated it, because I was in this Boy Scout troop with, in Minnesota, where there are these, like, seven-foot-tall Scandinavian teenage boys who like to wrestle, and then there's, you know, like, Asian Tyler over here who likes to draw, and I just felt, like, a lot of um, otherness and kind of ex exclusion, but something that I loved about camping 
was being with nature. And so the, the other Boy Scouts would go off and go to set their bear traps or do whatever, <laughs> whatever, shoot their guns, whatever they did. And I would love to go into a field and see how the trees and the birds and the sky and the tall grasses blowing in the wind, all of those are so different from each other, but God made them different intentionally to work together instead of them working together, despite the fact that they're different. And so that kind of helped me come to terms with, I think my own difference as a, as a person. And, and so that, yeah, I've always felt a, a really deep emotional connection to nature and a sacred connection to nature. But then on the other side of things, um, I'm, a, I'm the son of an immigrant. My dad is from Hong Kong and my mom is a white woman from Minnetonka, Minnesota. <laughs> and so uh, they met at a disco dancing class at a, at a time when it really wasn't that um, popular for people to, for uh, interracial couples to happen. And so uh, they really had to defend themselves both from kind of public judgment, but also from the judgment of their families. Um, and so I think from seeing that and, and um, living into that narrative as a family, uh, these values of justice and inclusion and fairness were deeply ground into me. And so I grew up with, uh, with this love of nature, with this uh, passion for fairness and justice. And I didn't see that they really had to do anything with each other until really until I got to college and, and later to seminary, um, when I realized that because of the way that our society is structured, some people have access to nature and some people don't. And some people have access to clean air and some people don't, or fresh food or clean water or access to green collar jobs or whatever. And I realized that um, the earth and environmentalism and the sacred connection that I felt is also a deeply racialized issue and an economic issue as well. And so when the Minnesota Annual Conference of the Methodist Church um, uh, suggested that I plant a ministry, they, they invited me to really consider what is the, the deep hunger of my heart. And I realized that um, there needs to be a church plant that focuses on environmental justice. So um, I, I uh, went out to Minneapolis, I looked at every neighborhood that is here and I realized that Powderhorn and the Phillips neighborhoods are really the best place for this. And I've been planting ever since. What makes Phillips and Powderhorn the best place for an environmental justice focused ministry? Oh, sure. So um, Powderhorn Park and Phillips are extremely diverse neighborhoods. Uh, there's a significant African-American, um, Latino, uh, Mexican, Ecuadorian uh, population, as well as a Somali population. A Somali and Ethiopian, I should say. And so um, all of these communities are, are together in ways that are really cohesive and still communal. Um, so it's kind of like that, that field that I was talking about in Boy Scouts, right? Like there are so many different parts, but all of them are working together. And so I just felt like there was a lot of spirit moving in this place. But at the same time, because there are people of color here and because um, there's, a, there's quite a bit of poverty in these neighborhoods, there's also a lot of pollution. And so um, there is a lot of factories polluting the air and um, access to fresh food is something that's always a struggle. So that, those are kind of some of the dynamics that I felt like were ripe for New City Church. And most recently, um, I was talking to some folks and, and I'm realizing that one of the deep concerns and passions of this community is gentrification. It's happening in every city in the US, but it's certainly happening in Minneapolis where there's a community of color that uh, has a lot of poverty in it. And because of that, it's quite affordable. Um, and that's been established there for decades. And then um, young white, white or whiter professionals come in. And because of the new resources that they bring in, the rent and the property values skyrocket. And so the people uh, who were originally there, the people of color who were originally there, have to move out to another place. And the, the dots really connected for me, Dale, when I realized that gentrification is an environmental justice issue. Because what the city is telling people is that, you know, uh, poor people like you shouldn't live in a place that's this safe and this green. So 
you should move out to a, a, a more polluted place, despite the fact that this neighborhood became safe and green because of local activists. So um, that is something that I, I really feel like New City Church is, is having a lot of conversations about. So how would you describe the application of an eco-theology in your context of ministry? I was recently in, a, in an article in the New York Times. I think that's how we initially got connected. And the title, I can't remember the exact wording, but it was something like, Methodist church planters start uh, or spread the environmental gospel. And I thought that was such an interesting phrase, environmental gospel. Um, it reminds me of, I have some friends um, uh, in India who are doing yoga training, and they think it's so funny that America invented this like yoga for runners, yoga for engineers, yoga for teachers. And they're saying like, no, really, it's actually just yoga. <laughs> and, it, and it's being applied in different circumstances. And so similarly, I don't think that there is an environmentalist gospel. I think that there's a gospel, and it just so happens that we are living in a day and an age where our earth is in crisis, and we are in a stratified racial context that demand a resurrection of an environmental justice sort. So <laughs> yeah, I, th I think that at the core, um, what New City Church is talking about is not so different from the gospel and resurrection that other churches are talking about, but where we make our difference and where we stake our claim is that the gospel speaks prophetically to the people living in this neighborhood, that the gospel matters for how we form our policies, for how urbanism happens, and how we relate to our neighbor. And so the, the task of New City Church is inviting in the, the grace of Jesus Christ to heal us so that our families might be healed, so that we might be a blessing to our community, and so that ultimately we can build a city that reflects the city that we see in uh, Revelation 21, where all tribes are coming together in joy to worship God. And so, and that, so that's the video, uh, that's the vision of New City Church, and, and that's why we must be both environmental justice and gospel oriented. So what does environmental justice mean for New City Church in particular? The way that I talk about creation changes every day because I'm, I'm learning more and more about this community and the rich diversity that it brings. And there are just certain phrases and, and images that resonate with people better than others. And so, uh, you know, I used, to, I used to call this ministry an eco-church. I'm starting an eco-church. And I was talking to some of my African-American friends, and they said, you know, eco-church sounds like something that's very expensive. <laughs> like, it sounds like something that I pay extra for that I don't really need. And I never talked about it as an eco-church again. <laughs> like, that was the end. Um, and, and similarly, you know, I used to talk about environmental justice as like, you know, we really have to shut down this factory because it's giving our kids asthma, kind of the classic environmental justice image. Um, and, th and that was resonant with people, but it wasn't really until we started talking about gentrification that people's hearts came alive and that and then people really started getting into it. And so I'll be the first to admit that um, New City Church is probably not going to be the best church to be speaking prophetically about um, like climate change as it's been framed by the national discourse, because the national discourse is steered by people who are very well educated in a formal education setting, generally white and middle to upper middle class. And, and they've been able to use um, imagery, science, discussion in ways that are resonant for them. And the folks in my neighborhood um, just see the world in a different way. It's, it's so much more relational and family driven. It's so much more just trying to get by day by day. And, um, and it's, it's also coming to terms with a lot of chaos. And so when I talk, of, you know, like when I do bring up climate change and saying like, wow, this could really bring a lot of problems, kind of the, some of the response that I get sometimes is like, yeah, well, I already got a lot of problems. So like, this isn't really making me excited to engage climate change because I'm just trying to figure out how to feed the mouths in my household, you know? And so I think uh, for New City Church, it's had to be very, very um, 
particular, very place driven and, and always applying to the everyday lives of people. And so always talking about like what this means for when you wake up tomorrow morning and you're facing your whole day. And, th and that's why we're talking about gentrification. That's why we're talking about um, uh, like food, uh, being able to afford food and being able to make rent and being able to build a safe community. All of those things have environmental justice implications. But if I just kind of started out with the climate change conversation, then I would get a lot more of what we're already seeing, which are which is gatherings of of the the, the communities that we talked about, which is a great thing, by the way. Like I love, I I have become an environmentalist through. The, the white middle class discourse, but it's just not enough for the community that I live in. Who are some of the theologians that have helped shape your theology? Oh gosh, yeah, so many. Um, like uh, Yvonne Jabara is a Brazilian ecofeminist writer. Her her book Longing for Running Water was really helpful. Um, Sally McFagg. Uh, speaks really passionately about this, Rosemary Radford Ruther. Um, but honestly, I think that like all, all of the people I just named helped me to kind of construct a environmental just, an environmentalist theology and eco-theology. Um, but I think really what's been helpful is having the lived experience of connecting with nature and then just reading Christian authors about putting language around what's happening in the interior experience. So like reading Richard Rohr has been really formative to me. Uh, he's a, a Catholic priest who does lots of work around um, like true self, false self. And um, that has spoken really, um, that has been really luminous for my, my experience while I'm in nature and thinking about who my true self is and who my false self is. And that's kind of been a, lo a lot more um, applied, I guess, of a theology. So, so I'd say those folks. Um, Bill McKibben is a United Methodist Sunday School teacher, so I count him as part of the flock. <laughs> so he, they, his his work has been really impactful, and and really just talking to people on the street, like the people in the neighborhood, the the street theology that's here, I think is. Um, more formative than anything because it's bound up in a relationship. We are, I mean, really the age that we're in is, is this renaissance, both of religious life and of environmental life. And I think that's why something like New City Church is possible because we're really re-examining how we do church and how Christian life happens, especially in America. And we're also coming to terms with the fact that our environmentalist uh, frameworks are destroying us. And so we need to radically re-examine both of those things. And actually, I think the solution to both of those things lies in, in the one gospel, right? Like, I, th I think that following Jesus tends to um, heal a lot of those things. So that's why New City Church is happening, for sure. Anything else you'd like to share? Well, I'm grateful. I'm grateful for the invitation to talk about this. Um, I think it's interesting because... In an earlier age, um, like late 1800s, early 1900s, especially, well, even before then, but in an earlier age, uh, there was a lot of fire and brimstone preaching coming from the church saying the end is near, repent now, like God is going to come and like bad things are going to happen. And there were the, th that was in contrast to the scientific community that was saying, no, the scientific method can solve these problems. So there's a calm way to go about this. We don't need to get all riled up about fire and brimstone. And now it's kind of that the tables have turned uh, because it's the scientific community that's saying we are in deep, deep, deep trouble. And more and more scientists are saying every day that we've, we've already gone too far. Like there's no turning back for the amount of damage that we've done for the planet. And it's now the time for faith communities to step up and say, we have a hope that is grounded in a God that is greater than us all. And we have hope in a resurrection that is greater than the sins that we have committed against our planet. And so, yes, we're going to have to face the consequence of our sin and of our destruction of the planet. 
but our hope is grounded in something that will stay with us no matter what. We'll never be alone in this. And that I think is, is a message that needs to be said on a, on a national and a global level. Not long after that conversation with Tyler Sitt, I saw an announcement that New City Church had hired two new staff, a married couple, Adam and Tori Hajberg, as Director of Ecotheology Initiatives and Director of Community Development. I'm hoping I can get some time with them to share a bit about their plans and then publish it to YouTube as an Ecclesia Extra. Ecclesia Extras are a key part of what I envision for Eco Ecclesia since it will free me completely from the old style talk show format as well as the problem of length. I'm seriously considering making future episodes, even this one and perhaps the previous two, modular, so that several smaller, shorter segments can be available, targeted to a particular subject or train of thought. The internet has freed the concept of video from the older, usual constraints of broadcast time and schedules, as well as having to package it all into a 30 or 60 minute time slot. Many of the church action stories like that of New City Church can only be told as an ongoing story and bring home the learning and the evolution that takes place as new challenges are met and new callings to particular ministries evolve. Extras will be the modules that do not require a larger content container, which may well prevent a lot of people from seeing it from the, for the simple reason that many people just don't feel like they have the time for 30 or 40 minutes unless they're real crisis conscious academically geeky types like me who have no problem watching talking heads, particularly if they're interesting and captivating. Since I tend to be neither one of those, the modular option could be a win-win. And a reminder, in this same vein, I'm determined to break down some barriers to making something like Google Hangouts really work for enabling online conversations. That's conversation with a capital C-O-N-V, you get the picture, it's been about five years now since Google released Hangouts, and it still has some unfixed bugs or annoyances, but I'm still hoping it will get better. But we need some more people at least trying to get conversations done in order to get enough voice to prompt Google to continue development. I actually tried a Hangout for post-show conversation around episode one, but I haven't quite solved the problem of notifications that Google still has with Hangouts. But stay tuned to use an old TV vernacular. That's all for now. See you next time when I'll be talking to Norman Wiersma, Professor of Theology and Ecology at Duke Divinity School. When we only engage reality, or primarily engage reality in terms of what it'll do for us, uh, then the integrity of other creatures is denied. It would be like me being in a relationship with you but only being in it insofar as I can get you, Dale, to do what I want. Or you to satisfy my desire or allay my fears or whatever that happens to be. And so the integrity of who you are is denied.